And now it's time for our feature presentation, which is our speaker. And I am so excited, excited to hear from our speaker. And I know that you are gonna enjoy her as well. Group Vice President of Strategy at Digitas, hater of jargon, founder of fashion brand Rabble and Rouse. One of her claims to fame is that she was voted best local Rabble Rouser by Creative Loafing and listed right underneath the late Congressman John Lewis, who was voted best local hero. I want you to welcome to our Creative Mornings virtual stage, Vanessa Toro. What an intro. I have nothing left to say. That's it. That, that's everything about me. Um, so happy to be here. Long time listener, first time speaker. Can you see my screen? Great, great. So let's start in some very familiar territory. There is likely no one on this call who has not seen this quote or heard it ad nauseum. And maybe like me, you were never quite feeling it. You understood it intellectually, but like, okay, Gandhi, you know, that works for you. What about the rest of us? You know, what about average people who don't have crazy followings, who have jobs, and no free time. And it just never really resonated with me. It has taken some time, but I have finally gotten on board with Gandhi. And it's through lessons, large and small, that I came to the realization that Homeboy was right, uh, but more importantly, that every single person on this call and 7 billion people that are not on it have radically changed the trajectory of someone's life. Because of you, someone did not give up. Because of you, someone did not feel alone. Because of you showing up in an unwelcoming environment as your full self, they felt permission to do it too. And the thing is, every single morning, when you step out into the world, you are unleashing your ripple. The way that you greet someone. That was my little ripple sound. If you snap at a coworker, the way you answer the phone. When you call on someone who feels invisible. The good news and the bad news is that you can't opt out. You don't have an option to not make a ripple. Your mere existence does it. Just as stepping in the water creates ripples, there's no way to not do it. The only thing you can control is the energy. And we've all been here, right? Where we've had an either uplifting interaction or a degrading one. And it colors the rest of our day or at least our mindset for a while. And we carry that with us. It is a rare person who does not react to being cut off have someone laying on the horn, flipping you off and scaring the hell out of you, right? That energy, you then carry it with you. It might affect the way you arrive at work. And so knowing how these energies and moods transfer, I want you to consider the fact that it's very reasonable to expect that you interact with 10 people a day with whom you share energy. And those 10 people go on to interact with 10 other ones each. That only needs to happen four more times for it to reach 1 million people. It's not my ambition to reach a million people and I you know, am not gonna wax poetic about that. What I'm here to talk about is 
you don't need to reach a million, you need to reach your corner because the ripples will extend. They will reach the other corner. So today I'm gonna to share three ripples that I unintentionally set off and what it's been like to see that effect travel. The first one is around body language. You know, <laughs> you know when you start working out a muscle that you don't normally engage, you know, let's say legs, let's say you normally skip legs. And you, after you work out, you have that like quiver, that tremble, like muscle failure. So that used to happen to me at the corners of my mouth when I would smile <laughs> because I was so unused to it. So this is my, I'm not upset. I do not have an opinion face. It's also called resting bitch face. But I assure you that I was born like this. This is not putting on any kind of affectation. I really was born like this. Unimpressed, skeptical. <laughs> and there was never any reason to do anything about the fact that I wasn't a big time smiler. First of all, I'm a woman. <laughs> Uh, street harassment is insane. Uh, I'm introverted and shy. I grew up in New England. Many, many reasons to not be so great at smiling. Then I moved to Atlanta. And for the first two weeks here, I was losing my mind like it was a Black Mirror episode perfect strangers waving at me from their cars. I know I don't know you, right? People saying hello, completely caught me off guard. Fortunately, I'm adaptable. <laughs> and within two weeks, I started responding in kind. And it felt good, right? A simple little thing, but there was this moment of connection, this eye contact, and I was riding this wave of like, sure, when people smile at me, I'm going to react, and the tremble went away. But then what's even bigger is that I started initiating it. And you don't know what a big deal this is for me. Think back to the baby picture, right? So aside from the dopamine and serotonin that I really need, it opens so many literal and metaphorical doors. I encountered kindness. I was invited to sit with a table when they saw me eating alone, even though I did not need that. <laughs> Guacamole was not extra a few times. I made new friends. And none of this was done with the intention of getting guacamole or anything else, but just out of the sheer enjoyment of showing all my teeth and having people respond in kind. And what I learned is that people, and occasionally I would encounter that person that did I, did this switch? Can you still hear me? It said it went to AirPods. Okay, cool. Um, I would encounter that person who's not nice or not in the right mood and a smile could disarm them. So <laughs> this was like a revelation to me. And I know that probably sounds absurd to people on the call, especially if you're Southern, but changing the way I interacted with the world with just smiling felt like a superpower. And now I'm probably known for my smile while for the first half of my life, I was known for the complete opposite. The next ripple is not around, uh, you know, body language, but sharing a creative outlet. And when I moved to Atlanta, I set my sights on finding an Easter egg hunt that I could go to, and there weren't any. 
they would say the ages and they had a cutoff and I didn't want people side-eyeing me for competing with children. So I said, what if there was an adult egg hunt with art eggs? And part of the reason that this appeals to me is because when we grow older, the notion of being playful or carefree is surrendered. There's an expectation that we're not gonna squeal anymore. And I love playing because people drop all pretense. There, there's no way you're gonna put on airs or act cool when you are racing someone to find an egg. And so this started as simply an invitation with the wooden egg to have artists customize them and people hunt for them. And the first year, it was a very small effort. It was only 25 eggs. And I asked artist friends, I think I might've even done one myself, um, but basically just wanted to put this little joyful art in the world. And that was in 2014. And since then, what this has become is an opportunity for people who've never labeled themselves artists to take part in it. It's so amazing to see people share with you, I picked up paints after 20 years, or I'm back into woodworking. And the notion that something as simple as this, this, this is not you know, a paradigm shift thing, was able to make people feel connected, make people feel inspired and sparked, is incredible. And there is nothing like becoming a part of people's spring rituals or their family traditions and watching hundreds of adults lined up in their Easter finest, ready to throw down to find eggs. It's so warming year after year to and want to. And this thing sort of just took off on its own. Again, my intention was this, but because you don't have control, the ripples came out and this became a community affair. Lastly, the most important ripple of all is your words. And this particular ripple is around words I do not like. So I think it was around 2010, you know, post-recession, we're dealing with life. This energy and zeitgeist of not caring, not giving a fuck took over everywhere. There were memes, hats, personalities. Everybody took on this, I don't care. And that really bothered me because I know the power of words. I know that what we see, we think, what we think we become. And I wanted to create damn givers. I wanted to intercept this apathy, this gloating over not being connected to each other or to the world. And that's solely the impetus for my ripple called Ravel and Rouse, which started with this phrase, give all the dams, simply a counter to no fucks given. And those damn givers showed up. I don't know that I've cultivated any, but they have found each other. They have found us. And there's nothing more rewarding than every time I check a new tag to see someone wearing something from Ravel while doing the work. There's very few fashion poses. It's people out in the community. It's people organizing, volunteering, protesting. 
I started this business in 2015 and it was great, whatever. Obviously 2016 ushered in a new era and an awakening. And that's really what, you know, allowed this to take off for some of those people who had tapped out. Unfortunately, it took hiring a celebrity for them to wake up. Now, I wanted to ensure that my ripple was felt. So part of setting this up was to create essentially a fund where I commit 20% of profits to local progressive causes. I wanna see the outcome of what I've shared with the world and the money that I've been able to raise with groups who are doing the work. But I never expected for it to take on a different dimension, to see Kamau Bell wearing it on The Daily Show, to become a part of people's art, which you know we know that's also a passion of mine, to have somebody risk getting in trouble for flower bombing a pedestrian bridge in San Francisco. And all of these things, this incredible slide is all the result of just being frustrated with the message that was being propagated and that I wanted to, you know, resist. And this is the most important thing that I want everyone to consider. The Gandhi quote never really hit it for me. People feel small, people don't know what they can do. And when we're constantly faced with trauma and violence and oppression and all the isms, it's very easy to feel hopeless and it's very easy to feel like anything you do is not worth doing. The abolitionist Miriam Kaba has this great quote, which I've paraphrased. Hope is not an emotion, it's a discipline. It's a daily practice to be intentional about your ripple, to acknowledge that it's going to go far beyond what you intended and you need to be okay with that. And we need to cultivate these moments. Joy is a form of resistance. Using your words is a form of resistance. And what I would want to leave you with is, please know that you are so powerful Every single day when you set foot in the world or when you hop on Zoom, you are starting a cascade. And if you're mindful with it, and if you don't allow other ripples that you're not feeling to affect you, you can take control of your life and you can help your community. So please ripple responsibly. Thank you. Yo, I hope y'all are putting all y'all applause, all y'all jazz hands. If anyone's legs can still cartwheel, you should do that because Vanessa, that that was very inspiring. I was I I was glad I was muted. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to hear you talk from me being like, mm, yeah, I mm, yes, honey, yes. People, we are taking questions that you can ask Vanessa. So raise your Zoom hands and I will try to get as many of your questions answered as possible. I think we've already got some Zoom hands going. Who's our first question? I think Andrew is helping me here. All right, looks like it's Chris Morris. I'm gonna unmute. Okay. Hey everybody. Um, so I've seen Vanessa, I've seen you all around town from doing Lotteria at um, Buford and a bunch of things. I once hung balloons for you on the west side. 
Um, I don't even remember what that was called. And bombshells was always great. I was always helping people go out and do stuff. But um, since you're always doing something, it seems like you have a million projects. What would you suggest for like first steps for someone who wants to do something and build community or help people out? Like, how do you how do you start to map that out in your head before you make you know the first movements to helping people? The key to that is that I don't, I don't map it out. That will interfere with you moving forward or moving forward quickly. Um, I'm the type of person that has bursts of energy and I tap into that. So when I'm feeling capable and like I wanna do a lot, all the things are happening. Um, so yeah, no, it's, I don't map it out. I mean, I do for clients, you know, to be mindful of, hey, what's it gonna take? But on a personal level, I really just am trying to, again, back to uh, Gandhi, who I disregarded, I'm just trying to create what I want to see. And if other people pick it up and start doing it too, yes. You know, I've seen people carry the egg hunt elsewhere. Other cities are starting to do it. You know, not pressed about that. Although I do send cease and desist to anybody using give all the dams. But other than that, I just let it go. We love a cease and desist when necessary. Mm -hmm. We love to see it. I have another raised hand. Another question for Vanessa. Oh, awesome. Hey guys, it's my first uh, creative morning. Um, Vanessa, awesome presentation. I have a question. Um, so I moved here in 2006 and one of the most difficult things for me has been being a, a generational Latino here from Los Angeles. And I'm just interested in knowing how you've navigated being Latina here in the city and you know what kind of ripples that has caused for you in your time here. In a city, in a city where our demographic is still very much so growing and a lot of us end up being from our countries of origin rather than you said you're from New England. My, my family's been in this country for over a hundred years. You know, it's been very difficult for me. I'm, I'm just interested in hearing your take. Yeah. So it's funny because prior to moving to Atlanta, I wasn't someone who sought out her people. I've always just moved through spaces. I've lived in different cities. And I think maybe my people were just always there. So there was a moment of um, not culture shock, but realizing that the conversation here is very black and white, literally. And there's good reason for that, right? And, and the conversation, particularly around civil rights needs to be focused on blackness. I found myself initially going to Buford Highway and literally walking through the farmer's market just to hear the accents. I was so homesick for my parents, for my culture, that I just wanted to hear about somebody's quinceanera planning. And it was, it's a strange thing to go to a grocery store <laughs> to connect, but I just wanted to be immersed in working class people speaking Spanish with all their kids around, maybe pick up a few candles. And that's how it was initially. And it was kind of lonely. Um, I have done a decent job through my social channels of connecting with other Latinos one-on-one. -on -one. And fortunately, huepa, see, okay. Um, there, we have more things now. So Choloteca has been a great avenue to find others, particularly progressive Latinos, um, which is a whole, a whole mother thing. Um, then I got my whole family to move here. So parents, sister, my brother's coming next year. My uncle moved here, my cousin moved here. So that's part of it, right? Um, people like to, dismiss us, even though your family's been here a hundred years or more, I'm gonna be that anchor baby. I'm gonna cause chain migration. We're gonna leave New England. And you know, that's what I did. 
but um, I always keep my eye out. If there's gatherings, I try to connect. Um, but I've met a lot of people through the arts. So we're here, we're not organized, um, but it's not as lonely, um, but you have to make an effort because it's not, it's not effortless. Thanks, Nick. Oh my gosh, Vanessa, thank you so much. Who y'all, I hope that you learned so much from Vanessa. I hope that you hang up from this Zoom and begin your own journey of giving all of your dams as well. We put links to Rabble and Rouse um, as well as links to following Vanessa and some and some of your uh, other supporters. Vanessa, were like making sure people had the other links to everything as oh. well. So y'all got a lot of homework to go and follow Vanessa. Thank you for joining us. Thank sharing you. your story with us. I appreciate it so much. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. I had a blast. Well, Blake, I'm throwing to you. This is your, your final send off. This is your time. Do you have a, a dance that you've prepared Ooh, for us? No, but if we've got music, the dance <laughs> might just come. It might just happen. I'm going to let it roll. See what, see what happens. <laughs> hey, I do want to say thanks again. Vanessa, that was awesome. I'm going to think about my ripple throughout the day today. So thank you for just an awesome presentation. And I um, hope everyone had a great day. Hope you have a great weekend and good rest of your Friday. Go into the weekend excited and inspired.